Good afternoon, everyone. We're waiting for the uh, tree lighting traffic to thin a little bit, but uh, I think we'd better get underway. I am Ralph Rohner, and with my colleague, Professor Heidi Schooner, co-host of this program, which is the second in a four-part series on critical insights in the law and law practice, ethical and moral responsibility, sponsored by the Catholic University Law School. We welcome all of you to this rescheduled event on behalf of the Catholic University School of Law, and particularly supported and encouraged by Dean Vero Miles, who has encouraged and supported this program and many others in the law school. I think she said I could wrap her greetings around my own, so consider yourselves greeted by the Dean as well. Our speakers uh, for this evening uh, include uh, Eric Stein, who is Deputy Assistant Secretary in the United States Treasury Department, Oliver Ireland, who is a partner at Morrison and Forster with a long career as counsel in the Federal Reserve System and for the Board of Governors, and Professor Arthur Wilmarth, longtime practitioner in the banking law field and since 1986, I think, a faculty member at the George Washington University Law School. Each speaker is allotted a bit short of 20 minutes. Heidi or I will give each speaker a starter question to launch their remarks, but we can't control what they say after that. <laughs> we should have about a half an hour at the end for questions and comments within the panel and from the audience, so please hold your questions until then, unless you find that something that is said is so outrageous that you can't control yourself. My only quasi-substantive comment is a disclosure. I actually remember when the National Commission on Consumer Finance published its report 37 years ago this month. Among other things, that report recommended the creation of a Bureau of Consumer Credit within a more comprehensive Consumer Protection Agency, or alternatively, a freestanding Consumer Credit Agency. Whether that proposal was politically unpalatable or just ahead of its time, it was not enacted then. I mention this not to suggest a need for historical research or justification, but just to note that the Congress is not writing on a completely clean slate. With that, let me ask uh, Professor Schooner to give us a bit of context. Thank you, Ralph, and welcome, everybody. I'm happy to be here. Thanks to our dean for encouraging us in this project. So just, I'm going to keep it really brief because I want to hear from the experts. Uh, but just to give you a little background on the Consumer Financial Protection Agency. I think the idea for that agency was really uh, born out of an observation that there were structural or architectural flaws in the federal system for uh, consumer financial services. And the structural flaws are basically uh, three of them. Uh, first is the observation that the combination of consumer protection with prudential or safety and soundness uh, goals within a single agency uh, may either require agencies to deal with potentially conflicting goals or at very least will place consumer protection behind uh, what might seem like a more important uh, prudential or safety and soundness goal. Uh, another structural f uh, potential structural flaw uh, is that under the existing system where the responsibility for uh, federal consumer protection laws is spread among 10 or so agencies. There's no single agency that really has had the opportunity to develop expertise in that area. And then finally, that this diffuse assignment of responsibilities uh, also encourages regulatory arbitrage, uh, or what's more commonly known as the race to the bottom. Uh, so these structural concerns can be addressed, if you buy into them, can be addressed by the creation of a single agency with a single goal. It would end any conflict or competition among goals within a single agency, uh, and it would also allow for the development of, of expertise and at least reduce the opportunities for arbitrage. Of course, the actual solutions are never simple. I'm going to leave all those devilish details to our experts. Um, but let me just give a brief and very oversimplified uh, uh, overview 
of the legislation that is under consideration, and I'm primarily drawing on, on the House bill. So uh, the House bill would create a consumer financial protection agency, and it would be a independent agency headed by a director who's appointed by the president, confirmed by the Senate. I just note that uh, Senator Dodd's proposal would have the agency run by a five-member body instead of a single director. Uh, the purpose of the agency would be that it would be responsible for rulemaking, examination, and enforcement of federal consumer finance laws, which means that we would transfer that authority from various existing federal agencies, the Fed, the FDIC, the OTC, the OCC, and uh, among others. Uh, the CFPA would also have the authority to address unfair, deceptive, and abusive practices uh, that it identifies in the future. It would have the authority to examine both banks and non-banks. The agency would be supported by two boards, the Consumer Financial Protection Oversight Board, which would be a board that's created to advise the director and inform the director of emerging practices in consumer financial services uh, in the industry, and also by the Consumer Advisory Board, which uh, is intended to be a panel of experts that represent the interests of both the industry and consumers. Uh, among many of the interesting aspects of the bill is the uh, issue of the preservation of state law. The legislation states that it does not preempt state laws which impose stricter standards than the federal law, and perhaps uh, most interestingly provides that national banks shall generally have to comply with state law unless, among a few other alternatives, the OCC determines by regulation on a case-by-case case case basis that a state law uh, prevents or significantly interferes with the ability of a national bank to engage in the business of banking. There are, of course, many exceptions under the legislation. Non-financial businesses are exempt. <coughs> so are products such as securities, commodities, investment products, and general insurance products. With that, I will leave it to our panel to delve into the more interesting aspects of this legislation. Thank you, Thank you Heidi. Uh, Mr. Stein, let me give you a question to get you started. Regulatory and enforcement authority for consumer financial products is scattered among nine or 10 federal agencies. And that is perceived as a source of regulatory and enforcement stalemate and inertia, or worse, over recent years. How is the creation and deployment of another federal agency going to solve the problem of too many cooks in the kitchen? promise to get to that question. Consolidation, that's the answer. Um, thanks for having me, Ralph and Heidi. Um, thanks for coming. Um, President Obama has put forward a comprehensive plan for reform, closing loopholes in our laws that fed the financial crisis. In the years leading up to the crisis, Wall Street firms took huge risks with borrowed funds and little of their own capital at stake, while failing to appreciate the risk that they were creating. It's clear that a massive failure of consumer protection it's not the only cause of the current crisis, but it's a very significant cause of the current crisis. Firms offering mortgages and credit cards lured families in with promises of low interest rates, did not make them aware of the fine print, hidden fees, and future payment increases. It's true that many took on too much debt and took out loans that they couldn't afford. However, millions of Americans behave responsibly and still found themselves in jeopardy because of sharp practices of some in the financial industry. This, as everybody knows, led to a near collapse of our financial system um, massive amounts of foreclosure, uh, bankruptcies, loss of family wealth, uh, and taxpayer costs, uh, spillover effects from people losing their home, people in the neighborhood uh, losing property values because people in their neighborhood lost their home. It's clear to the administration, to the president, to the secretary of the treasury, that the status quo simply did not work um, at all. The status quo is not an option as we think about what sh we should do going forward. Um, and in doing a post-mortem of the consumer protection uh, protections, consumer protection uh, regulatory regime, uh, there are really three things that we found in diagnosing the problem as to why it failed so significantly. The first is, and I'll, this will be repeating a lot, Heidi's uh, introduction was quite good and I'll be a little shorter than I would have been, um, is first that there is no one agency that has a focus on this. Um, when consumer protection is everybody's job, then in some sense it's nobody's job. Nobody's accountable, nobody's responsible for it. On the um, 
uh, when banking agencies, which cover part of the market, their primary role, as everybody knows, is safety and soundness, and that's appropriately their primary role. And consumer protection is, is simply, almost by definition, going to uh, be in a subordinate status, and we did see that. There, uh, it's, so it's not a knock on the staff of the regulatory agencies to say that it's a structural problem, uh, that that was simply not their focus, not the focus of the agency. It's, a, it's an issue of structure. The second problem that we diagnosed looking back as to why consumer protection failed so significantly is that there was no agency with market-wide jurisdiction. Instead, we had fragmented jurisdiction, and that leads to the arbitrage and race to the bottom that Heidi mentions. There's two different uh, forms of arbitrage that really uh, played significant roles. The first is between the banking and the non-bank sector. You could choose if offering the same product, whether to incorporate as a bank, have bank regulators um, watching you or not, and not have any agency at the federal level with responsibility to supervise you. The only thing that at the federal level that you could do is after the fact enforcement by the Federal Trade Commission, which did terrific work. But if you think about the number of problems that would have to occur before they become so evident that a federal agency wants to do something, and then the litigation process, there's been a lot of harm that's been caused before the law enforcement model um, can be effective. And once um, and capital flowed to the less supervised non-bank um, area because of that reduced supervision, which then puts pressure on the banking sector to compete. You, you're, you've given responsible lenders, responsible financial institutions, a choice that's really untenable. One is opt out of these um, market because the only way to compete is by following uh, the race to the bottom and doing practices that you wouldn't otherwise want to do, but that's the only way that you can keep customers. That's really an untenable choice, but it's the one that was presented. And it's clear that practices did migrate to the banking sector. Um, there was, uh, for subprime mortgages, is kind of the classical example. This reached a $700 billion a year industry, 20% of the mortgage market, and half of the loans were by banks, uh, of higher cost loans were by banks, bank subsidiaries, and bank affiliates. It wasn't all just in the non-bank uh, sector. And the foreclosure rates projected on subprime loans are just astronomical. A Federal Reserve researcher projected a 45% of people who took out subprime loans in, I think it was 2007, would lose their home to foreclosure. These are not, uh, nobody's loans, subprime loans have performed well. And then you have, within the banking sector, you have arbitrage because you have the decision, do I want to be incorporated as a state bank or a federal uh, nationally chartered bank, and then which national uh, federally chartered entity do I want to supervise me? and the banks can switch supervisors, and simply that pressure, uh, the knowledge that the supervisors have that the bank can switch to another charter, and it certainly happened, puts pressure not to be too strict on them because you could lose your, uh, the people that you regulate. And from a consumer protection uh, perspective, that arbitrage really was quite damaging. And the third thing that we noticed in diagnosing the problem is that this agency that didn't exist, that didn't have market-wide coverage, also didn't have the consolidated authorities, again, that Heidi mentioned, which is not just rulemaking, not just enforcement like the FTC, but also supervision to go in and try to stop problems before they become manifest. And some examples of that, getting back to Ralph's question, is in rule writing, there's 15 to 20 what we call enumerated statutes or con existing consumer protection statutes, and the rule writing responsibility is divided among seven different agencies. That's a lot of coordination. I mean, think about uh, TILA and RESPA. When someone get, takes out a mortgage loan, there's one statute that deals with the Cost of Credit Truth in Lending Act that the Federal Reserve issues rules on, another um, Real Estate Settlement Practices Act, uh, RESPA, that HUD does, and they both try to tell the, the home borrower uh, a little bit about what the cost of credit so that they can compare, but they use different terminology, different forms, and they're trying their best to um, bring the um, forms together currently, but it's been a long time and it hasn't, hasn't happened yet. This one agency would have the, actually the responsibility under the Act to bring them into one understandable form. Another example, the Fair and Accurate Credit Transactions Act, six agencies were given the responsibility to put right rules on this very important topic of making sure that credit report data is accurate. And if it's not, that you can get that fixed. It took six years. It's just, again, it's not that the people in the individual agencies are bad people are not uh, very capable, it's just very difficult coordination 
to occur. And the final example there will be the subprime and non-traditional mortgage guidances, which all the federal agencies had to get together. They saw the problem of subprime lending and non-traditional loans, the payment option arms, um, interest only, before it happened. And it just took a long time to get together to write guidance. So by the time there was guidance on disclosures for subprime, I think that was 2008. I mean, the subprime market was shut down by then. And since the structure um, is the problem, in our belief, the structure must be the solution, changing the structure to address these three problems that we saw, which led us to the consumer, uh, led the president to um, propo propose the Consumer Financial Protection Agency. There would be um, one agency, it would have the mission of consumer protection. Uh, each agency, so there'd be accountability at the federal level. Who, who's responsible for this? Well, we know who's responsible for it. You know, who's responsible for safety and soundness? We know that. Um, this uh, agency would cover the entire market, so there wouldn't be the uh, jumping back and forth from the non-bank to the bank sector and within the banking sector. If you offered a mortgage, you're going to be subject to the same rules um, and the same authorities, as I'll get to in a second. Um, there, uh, and, uh, and then the third thing, the third sort of fix on that is the full authorities, which in one sense it's a little bit scary. You're giving an agency with significant power. It's similar to what the bank agencies have now. But in our view, if you have uh, different tools that you can uh, use, then you don't have to reach for the hammer every time. Writing a rule is a very... It's a very substantial thing to do. It takes a couple years. It affects everybody. But if you are supervising institutions and you can see problems, you can issue supervisory guidance. You can do a memorandum of understanding with that one institution and fix that one problem um, as opposed to hitting everybody over the head with a new rule. And we think that having the learning uh, from supervising institutions really informs the rule writing so that you see what really is happening with institutions. You're not writing rules just for the most egregious acts that you see because of complaints, you see what's happening in the ordinary course, and you can be much more balanced, much more knowledgeable. And so having the authorities of rule writing, of supervision, as well as enforcement as a backstop, we think it's important. And we think it's actually helpful for uh, banks and financial institutions that this agency really knows what it's doing um, when it writes rules. The powers that it would have are actually less than what the federal banking agencies have. In terms of the definition of financial products, it's a subset of what banks can do. Um, in terms of authorities, it's less than what the banking agencies um, can do. Under the Federal Deposit um, Insurance Act, the banking agencies are responsible for safety and soundness. Those are two broad words, and under that, um, this disclosure that I mentioned that was too late but was still a very good idea on subprime disclosures talks about clear and balanced disclosures for subprime under the the authority granted by the safety and soundness requirement. Um, the OCC did guidelines on predatory lending in 2005 that talked about not, uh, not providing abusive loans um, that were unfair or deceptive under the authority of the safety and soundness. And um, that's a, those, those are similar authorities to what we're trying to give to the new CFPA. The, uh, as I mentioned, the combined authorities, uh, we think, really provide a balanced, uh, focused mission uh, the mission state, if you read the legislation, talks about uh, providing the agency with the information so people can make responsible decisions and create efficient markets. The focus, one of the mandates to the agency is that it uh, act in ways that promote access to credit um, for impact on consumers and to weigh the cost to providers um, before it does rules. It needs to consult with safety and soundness regulators before it issues rules. Um, there, there are certain, Congress has directly spoken on a number of things with those consumer protection statutes I mentioned. The agency can't ignore those when it does rules. It's going to have to follow them. Otherwise, uh, it's going to be a violation. It doesn't have free reign to do whatever it, it wants. There's congressional oversight. Um, and uh, and it, can be, it can be tailored when it goes in to address a problem because it has different tools at its disposal. The, um, and the final thing that I would like to... Um, end with is gets to the expertise point that Heidi mentioned. By having an agency with the responsibility for consumer financial protection across the entire market, you have somebody who really has the incentive to develop expertise there, both in the rule writing context, but also in research and trying to see where the problems are. Um, you have, right now, it doesn't necessarily make so much sense for one regulatory agency to invest huge amounts in trying to learn about different types of 
financial products because they have their institutions they have to focus on. And there's a little bit of a tragedy of the commons that no one is really incented to make those, those investments. But um, if, one, if CFPA were here, it has the mandate to do research where emerging risks are, to every year survey the market and report to Congress and the public on where risks are significant. Um, and by doing supervision and going in, it would have gone into the large independent mortgage companies that started the move towards subprime lending. It would have seen the risks developing early. And because it's the agency respond, responsible for responding, it could have responded much more quickly. Uh, so we've, we believe we've learned some of the lessons of the problems. There's other significant problems that occurred as well. The administration has a long uh, 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 proposal for regulatory reform. This is a piece of it, but it's a very important piece of it. Um, and thanks for listening. Thanks a lot, Eric. Is this working? It is. Uh, so, in my opening remarks, I uh, emphasized or pointed out uh, that the goal of consumer protection and the goal of safety and soundness can sometimes be conflicting, uh, and therefore the potential structural flaw is that having conflicting goals within the same agency creates a problem. Of course, there's a counterargument that they actually don't conflict and that they are synergistic goals, that uh, ensuring that there aren't abusive loans made uh, is also a good way of making sure that sound loans are made, for example, so that there is a synergy in those goals as well. Uh, so the, the financial institutions in industry seems to have latched onto that concept and uh, suggested that the CFPA proposal is uh, really flawed because it threatens safety and soundness by separating uh, these two functions. Um, and so my question for Ollie is, uh, and he's free to answer it or not, uh, is uh, why isn't it an advantage to separate uh, safety and soundness from consumer protection in that uh, that would allow the agency, the bank regulators, for example, to be uh, solely focused on that, uh, that goal uh, and then the corollary of that, letting the consumer uh, protection agency be solely focused on that. Why, why is it necessarily that, uh, that Separating the two undermines safety and soundness. Well, Eric has made the case uh, for horizontal integration of the regulatory system, and I'm not going. I'm not going to argue with what he said about horizontal integration. But as you pointed out, Heidi, I'm going to talk about vertical integration, which I think is is equally important. And the question is how to create a structure that accomplishes both of those goals and whether you can do that in a single agency or multiple agencies I, I think is uh, almost semantic which what you have to do I, or I think what you want to do is to reckon to simplify the system to the extent that you can uh, while maintaining opportunities for innovation and to balance uh, the <coughs> various interests at play uh, I think we have financial institutions and we have regulated financial institutions, banking institutions uh, at the federal level uh, since the National Bank Act in the 1860s and before that to a greater or lesser extent in the, some of the state laws with respect to state chartered or, or what were known as wildcat banks in the 1830s, 1840s. I'll leave out the first and second bank in the United States, which I don't think were really uh, credit intermediation vehicles so much. But if, if you've got, if you're going to have a market economy, which we, we seem to think uh, historically we're going to have, you want to be able to raise money and either invest that money in equity instruments or have that money lend out so that people can borrow it uh, to acquire goods and services, whether they are uh, commercial entities or consumers. And if I'm looking at the issue of consumer lending, my goal is for consumers to be able to get good loans. And I consider good loans to be loans that they can perform and if you have a very high level of defaults, as we had in the subprime multi mortgage markets, I don't think those are good loans. Uh, Eric uh, very generously suggests, I think, that 
the structure prevented the agency people from doing a, a better job, the existing agency people from doing a better job to address the problems that started in the subprime and all tape mortgage <coughs> markets. Uh, I think that the culture in some of those agencies, uh, which is not a necessary culture, prevented action both on the consumer side and on the bank supervisory side and that there were failures on the bank supervisory side that were every bit as important in the ultimate uh, problem that we had uh, as the failures on the consumer side. And let me give you a picture of what I think happened, and I'll try to do this quickly, and then you can and then posit how much of that you would have stopped by focusing only on the consumer end of the transaction. And I'll go back, and we had a dot-com bubble in the equities markets, and that burst, and the economy looked like it was going into hard times. We also had a, uh, an event, 9-11 uh, in New York, which caused people uh, a great deal of concern, and the natural reaction when you have both fear of, of violence, international violence, and fear of economic trouble is you pull, people pull back and they don't, they don't spend and it uh, puts you into a downward economic cycle. The Fed's typical response to that is to lower interest rates. And boy, did they lower interest rates. And they lowered interest rates to then historically low levels and they kept them there for a long period of time. And what that did was it started to create uh, what the Fed characterized as ultimately froth in the housing markets. Uh, what I, I, I find it very difficult to look at that as froth, which I think of as a lot of little bubbles. It was, it was uh, the biggest real estate, having lived through the, the 80s and 90s, 80s starting out with a real estate bubble in uh, farmland in the Midwest before it spread to the Texas oil patch and so on. This was, this was a bigger real estate bubble and a more pronounced real estate bubble. We had people in the Washington, D.C. area putting their houses on the market on uh, Saturday morning and selling them Monday for a price higher than they put it on the market for, and that was not uncommon. Uh, you, so you had rise, very rapidly rising housing prices fueled by very low interest rates. In that period, uh, when you have rising housing prices, you have very, very few mortgage defaults because the borrower can always either sell the house or refinance to pay off the mortgage, and so you see very few defaults, and so you are seeing rising prices and, and no defaults. At the same time, because you had very low interest rates, and you had low interest rates internationally, you had a lot of money, both in the United States and abroad, chasing yield. And it was looking for yield in rely, what were considered to be high quality debt instruments. And that turned uh, to the mortgage backed securitization market. Uh, Alt A and subprime mortgages tended to yield a higher rate of return. It created the demand for highly rated securities in those markets uh, that were, had high credit ratings. The uh, broke people underwriting those securities would, in effect, identify a demand for what they figured was a niche in, in the market and go out and order mortgages to fit those characteristics. And those were subprime, alt A mortgages, um, sometimes with particular geographic characteristics. <coughs> and they packaged them up and sold them. And after a while, <clears throat> The Fed decided that that party was over. They rather precipitously <clears throat> raised rates. And they did that without looking at the underlying instruments that were going to be affected by those uh, and which had fueled the growth of the economy and actually kept consumer spending during that period, which is, I think, what they wanted to do, uh, and to see if those transactions were robust enough to deal with the price fluctuations that were going to result from increased rates because increased rates are likely to have a downward pressure on housing prices or at least stop the bubble from going up. And uh, subprime lending had been around for a long time, but it used to be 60-40 lending. 
You do 80-20 mortgages and 60-40 subprime mortgages. And now we were seeing not 80-20 subprime mortgage, we we're basically seeing 100% subprime mortgages and all to A mortgages. And some of those with resets in the, in the interest rates so that the interest rates ratcheted up as interest rates, as the Fed raised rates. Those rates started to, to, to ratchet up for consumers. Consumers couldn't pay them. Uh, the liquidity in the, in the market was cutting off. The mortgage rates were going up because of the higher interest rates. The housing bubble stopped. It's, it started to recede. As you saw defaults in the subprime market, people realized that the asset-backed securities that were backed by subprime and Alt-A uh, mortgages were not good. That mortgage market froze up quite understandably. The freeze in that market spread to the prime mortgage back market and spread to other collateralized debt obligations, essentially freezing up the securitization markets, cutting credit for housing, less credit for housing, downward pressure on prices. As prices drop, people are increasingly unable to refinance or sell their houses to pay off the mortgages, which are now many of them have been made at um, higher loan to value ratios than before. More defaults, a downward spiral. The downward spiral was eventually, I think, may have been halted or at least slowed by putting an awful lot of money into both the economy generally and into the banking institutions. Uh, and I guess the question on the table is you look at the Consumer Financial Protection Agency and you just look at that in isolation and say to yourself, all right, would better disclosure or something like that uh, have helped? How much of that would have enabled consumers not to enter into those transactions? And they were riding a bubble. Uh, the idea that markets financial markets behave rationally may be true in sort of middle pricing when times are fairly stable. It is not historically true in either bubbles as prices go up or panics as prices go down. And whether better disclosure would have solved that problem, I don't think it would hurt. I think there should have been better disclosure. And uh, I think the Fed had the power to require better disclosure across the markets. I just don't think they did it. Uh, one of the other alternatives was to require people to, under, to underwrite those loans to uh, the full uh, rate that might apply after mortgage resets had occurred, which was one of the problems, but not by far the only problem. And is that a, a consumer protection issue or is that a safety and soundness issue? I think it's a good mortgage issue. And I think that in order to understand what was going on and how to deal with what was going on, uh, the regulatory community, however it is structured, really needed to be looking at what was going on in the securitization market, uh, creating a, a, an artificial, potentially artificially high demand for a class of riskier mortgage transactions and that actually some of the first warning signals probably should have come out of that market rather than waiting for the actual defaults in uh, the consumer transactions. So I, I think in my view, and not all of my clients would probably share that view, you need to really, regardless of whether you do it in uh, one, a, however you structure your agencies to do that, you need to have the agencies that are looked Coordinate, have a coordinated view of the entire transaction and working together in order to achieve the end goal, which is efficient financial intermediation, not uh, necessarily cons consumer protection in isolation. Uh, I think that there, is a ten there, there would be a potential tendency for an agency that is solely focused on consumer protection to not balance uh, the consumer interests uh, which it would be charged with promoting against the interests of 
actually encouraging money, I, I wouldn't put it as safety and soundness, encouraging money into that market to make, make uh, credit available. We have seen in the credit card world, right now we're hearing complaints about higher interest rates and less credit. Part of that, not all of it, part of that is due, I think, to regulatory changes that are affecting how credit cards are priced. If you go far enough in that direction, you're going to start to dry up the availability of funds or drive up the price of funds to invest in that market to be relent. And if you want to achieve what, what I think the ultimate goal ought to be is the lowest cost of funds to the consumer, all-in cost of funds to the consumer, and the most efficient transactions, I think you need to have an integrated view of the market. And I think the way they've structured uh, the Consumer Financial Protection Agency, I don't think it gets that. And I don't think it's adequately coordinated with the other uh, financial regulatory agencies that are involved. With that, I'll stop. All right, this is for you. The premise of the uh, CFPA bill seems to be that the multiplicity of regulatory and enforcement voices is bad because it inhibits the development of uniform national policies across all credit markets. Yet the bill aggressively seeks to retain a role for the states by removing preemption barriers to state action. Aren't these combined policies, strong centralized federal regulation, but with very limited preemption of state law structures, a non sequitur? The question's yours. Okay, thank you very much. I'd like to thank uh, Catholic University and uh, also uh, uh, Ralph and, and Heidi for inviting me to participate and certainly a uh, very timely topic and, and um, you know, we're still debating 80 years later you know, why the Great Depression happened and, and why uh, our regulators failed to prevent it from getting a lot worse. So uh, I, I suppose we'll, we'll be debating the same kind of issues about this crisis for a very long time. Um, but I, you know, I think that, that uh, uh, there's a fascinating issue about uh, what I would call uh, consolidation and diversification versus specialization. Uh, and, and, and that's a roundabout way to get into uh, Ralph's uh, question. But, you know, I think the fundamental question that everyone has to ask is why did risk management fail in all of these large institutions and in federal regulators? I mean, why did none of them, uh, you know, see the runaway train uh, and, and put on the brakes, you know, long before it jumped the tracks and, 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 and smashed into the, into the town. Uh, because I, I think that uh, Ali has done a, you know, very good job of, you know, uh, denominating all the markers that would have told us uh, this was a disaster waiting to happen. Um, when I first realized sort of what uh, uh, subprime mortgages, what they were made of, I immediately said, well, this is a Ponzi scheme. This is a musical chairs game because it was clear that, that uh, uh, since the, the lenders were not underwriting to the fully amortized rate, they were underwriting to the teaser rate, that, that, and they knew that the borrowers couldn't pay the fully amortized rate, then these mortgages had to be refinanced every two or three years. And, of course, that could only happen if housing prices kept going up. And then you began reading things like the ratings agencies saying, oh, yes, we can give these... Uh, these mortgage-backed securities or the CDOs, which are uh, resecuritizations of mortgage-backed securities, we, we can give them AAA ratings because uh, uh, there's a big enough pool. But they said, oh, by the way, uh, housing prices never go down. And, and uh, uh, I guess Ali and I are you know, kind of the more grizzled veterans here, but I mean, it wasn't that long ago. I mean, it wasn't that long ago we went through a, a, a tremendous rolling uh, real estate bust. Uh, it didn't happen all at one time, but by the time it was finished, it covered almost the entire country uh, from West Coast to East Coast and, and lar large parts of in between. And it's like, how could people be not thinking, uh, particularly when you, when you find out that the boom is happening in places like Arizona, California, Nevada, Florida, you know, all the usual suspects. I mean, it, it's almost a, a, you know, a giant replay of what we saw in the, in the, in the 80s. Um, and nobody stepped in. Um, and then, then, of course, securitization was taking off. And the whole idea, it was sort of a hot potato game. You know, as long as I get rid of it, uh, 
uh, it doesn't matter how toxic or how bad the loan is. And so the originator didn't care because uh, the broker didn't care. He sold it to the originator. The originator didn't care. He sold it to the securitizer. The securitizer didn't care. They sold it to the packager uh, of the mortgage-backed security. The mortgage-backed security packager sold it to the CDO person. And so the idea was, and then then they sold it to you know some fishing village in Norway or or, or the Chinese government or someplace. And the idea was. No, no problem. You know, we just sort of pass this stuff along, and of course, uh, again, it's, it seems amazing to me that that no one in these major banks who were doing many, much of the packaging and much of the promoting and much of the distributing, nor in the regulators who, uh, by the way, have you know, a resident examination teams at all of these. You know, I think in OCC, the top 17 banks had resident examination teams. I think at least uh, four or five of the biggest thrifts had them. Uh, so you had, you know, 24-7, 365 regulators on site, and it's what, I, I keep asking myself, what were they looking at? What were they seeing? Because, uh, you know, if, if you know, t packaging up nothing but junk, uh, and then slicing and dicing, so you suddenly make, you know, 80% of it AAA, and then the mezzanine part that's triple B, you repackage that and make 80% of that a triple A, and then, oh, by the way, you were selling off the, the uh, residual slices to hedge funds, but of course, the banks are giving loans to the hedge funds to finance the purchase of the residual slices. I mean, the whole thing, as you, as you uh, deconstruct it, uh, at least seems to me any, any one of, of, of a reasonably informed view, rational uh, perspective and disinterested perspective would say, this is all going to blow. It's all going to blow up. And, and, and nobody stepped in. Now, why? Why was that the case? Well, I think one of the, the, the stories, unfortunately, is that we had uh, an, an incredibly massive consolidation of the industry into a relatively small number of, en of enormous players. Um, so I did this study last spring, and, and you know, I came to the conclusion that you had about 17 institutions worldwide that really controlled you know, all of the financial markets. They weren't the only players, but they were the dominant players in market after market after market. And then when you find out who took most of the losses, you know, it's, 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 it's you know, th those 17 institutions as of April 2009 had taken more than half the losses uh, for financial institutions worldwide, a number of them had bail been bailed out uh, or nationalized. So uh, you, you had this, this small set of, of truly enormous players. They had enormous influence within the agencies and within Congress. Uh, I found the other day an interesting thing that in 1994, Congress uh, changed a provision of the, of the 1991 law, which was passed to respond to the last uh, uh, crisis. And that law said that, first of all, regulators had to establish standards uh, by regulation for safety and soundness. And if they found that an institution was not in compliance with these safety and soundness standards, they had to force the institution to adopt a compliance plan. You know, it seems rather straightforward. You, you adopt standards by regulation. If the institutions don't live up to them, you make them uh, develop a compliance plan. Suddenly in 1994, this provision has slipped in uh, to the Regal Neal Community Development Act, and it says the following. Well, now instead of adopting regulations, the agencies can adopt guidance, guidelines. And, oh, by the way, if they adopt guidelines and the industry and the, and the, and the banks don't live up to those, it's up to the regulators whether they force the institutions to develop compliance plans. They may or they may not. Well, it, it becomes rather suspicious then that for the next decade or so after 1994, a lot of what the agencies do that is you know, said to be safety and soundness is all done through guidelines. Suddenly, the idea of hard regulations with mandatory <coughs> sanctions sort of disappears and you have all these guidelines being issued. And, there is no hard regulation issued saying you've got to underwrite mortgages to the fully amortized rate so that you could you determine that the borrower can pay until 2008, at which point, you know, as I said somewhere else, somewhere else, the horses are not only out of the bar, but they're dead in the field by that time. I mean, it doesn't do much good at that point. So, you know, you see all this behavior. Why guidelines? Why no enforcement? Uh, almost no sanctions being issued against any of the large banks, and yet they're the ones at the center uh, of this whole dynamic because they were the ones who financed all the independent brokers and independent lenders, saying, you know, bring us your, your bring us your loans, and we'll we'll buy them, we'll package them, we'll 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 hand them on. Uh, as soon as the Wall Street and and big universal banks 
cut off their lines of credit, excuse me, uh, in, in, in the fall of 2007, people like New Century and, and Option One and, and, and these non-bank lenders just went under because they had no they had no permanent financing of their own. They were just conduits, you know, for the big guys. Uh, so there's a, unfortunately, there's a story of regulatory capture, and I, and I sort of sh share, you know, Ali's view that it's, you know, it, I, I don't need to point fingers, but the regulators, their, their failure to act is just, to me, in, inexplicable, because I know the quality of and, and intelligence of people uh, that, that work at these agencies, and it makes me think that there are people at the top of those agencies uh, who were saying, no, we don't want to go there. And certainly there were stories that at, at different agencies, there were people at top saying, no, we're not going to take that action. We're not going to, to crack down. Um, well, then the question becomes, uh, uh, what should we do going forward? Well, I, tend, I, I agree with Eric that uh, the, one of the problems, I think, with the federal banking agencies is that since consumer protection was viewed as a very small piece of their overall portfolio. I don't think it should have been, but that's the way it was viewed. It was always kind of a stepchild. Uh, it seems to me there, there's a case to be made for what I would call functional specialization. Uh, if, if none of the federal agencies were very interested in it, then why not take it out of those uh, supervisory agencies and put it in a specialized agency, uh, which, which then becomes their mission. Now, uh, it isn't as if this agency has, you know, uh, what's the right word? Uh, un unimpeachable or un unaccountable power. I mean, clearly, if if the CFPA were to be established and go haywire, you know, imposing ridiculous uh, requirements that make no sense, uh, the, the federal banking agencies will have every ability to push back. The industry will have every ability to push back. Congress, after all, is the ultimate arbiter. Uh, Congress can be persuaded to take away uh, authority or restrain authority the CFPA has, but it seems to me that that you had nobody looking out for the consumers, and in fact, in my view, no one looking out for uh, the taxpayers in, in the federal agencies for a very long time. Uh, I think it makes sense to have a check and balance and say, let's have a, a, an agency that really believes that its function is to protect consumers, uh, and in fact, the, the the purposes of the agency say you've got to balance, you've got to balance you know, the cost of regulation versus the benefit. You've got, to, you've got to balance the need to protect consumers versus the desire to provide credit to consumers. So uh, if the agency reads its purposes, it's not, it's not sort of like a laser-like agency that just says, you know, protect the, the consumer at all costs. Uh, but it seems to me that since all of the federal agencies, uh, you know, really fail to do the job, uh, it, it makes sense to, to try a different approach. Now, then the question becomes, what about the states? Uh, why give them any role? Well, uh, my sort of common sense answer is, well, the states were actually trying to do something. You know, more than 30 states passed some kind of anti-predatory lending law uh, during this run-up, this enormous credit bubble that occurred between the late 90s and, and 2007. But they were frustrated repeatedly because the OCC, which regulates national banks, and the OTS, which regulates federal thrifts, you know, cramped it all those laws, said you can't apply them to our banks. And then they went one step further and said, oh, by the way, you can't apply them to operating subsidiaries of our banks either. And oh, by the way, they went one step further and said, oh, and if, if these are brokers who bring loans that are, that are funded at, at, ta at closing by the national banks, so they're table-funded loans, you can't regulate the brokers either. Uh, so the, the states were largely, you know, uh, uh, hamstrung in terms of their ability to enforce these laws. Now, could the states have done better against the non-depositories? I think so, but I think it was somewhat demoralizing and crippling to say, uh, you know, you can only regulate against your state chartered entities. You can't touch the federal agencies or their the federal banks or their affiliates. And of course, all the business you know, and it did. The business increasingly migrated to. Uh, federal banks and their affiliates uh, as the preemption rules were put down. Um, so in my view, the states, one, because they're closer to their citizens, and I think they saw what was happening earlier. They weren't sitting just in Washington or just in large regional offices. Second, because AGs are elected. Uh, AGs are accountable to the citizens. AGs, attorney generals, see the ability, you know, the old joke, National Association of Attorney General means National Association of Aspiring Governors. They see the ability to get elected by pointing out abuses uh, and doing something about them. Uh, it's interesting that uh, Ali mentioned the dot-com telecom boom, uh, the Enron WorldCom scandals, the research analysts, the mutual fund uh, market timing, late 
trading, all that stuff, which was an absolute warning to us about what was coming. You know, the, the subprime thing was just a complete replay on a much bigger scale of a lot of what was done earlier. Uh, you know, who was in there first? Elliot Spitzer, uh, uh, William Galvin in, in Massachusetts. Uh, the states were in there first. The SEC didn't do anything until the states went in first. Uh, the Fed and the OCC didn't do anything about Enron and WorldCom and, until uh, you know Spitzer you know blew open a lot of the stuff or it was blown open uh, by the failure of Enron. And so my view is if someone actually sh indicates that they're interested in doing something constructive, why stop them? Uh, what the CFPA Act does essentially is to say the CFPA will establish a federal floor. The states can go further and be more restrictive as long as they aren't so uh, restrictive as to sort of you know, undermine or, or, or be inconsistent with the act. It seems to me uh, that kind of experimentation, that kind of you know, whistleblowing, that kind of uh, extra cop in the beat is not a bad thing. Uh, and again, I'll, I'll end by saying partly because uh, we have an enormously powerful financial services industry which has resisted every effort to be accountable. And even now is saying, both here and in England where they were similar, you don't need to do anything. You know, every, you know, good times have returned. Let us pay our bonuses. Let us go back to the way we were. Don't touch us. And I'm thinking, you know, they, they haven't even shown any contrition, any, any, you know, a feeling that okay, some things ought to change. Uh, well, you know, if the states again have been willing to act against these players, um, my view is, you know, why, you know, why take that role against away from the states? I think we need, uh, we need more uh, scrutiny, more enforcement. Uh, as I say, by, by more players. I'm, 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 I'm not a, a fan of consolidation either in government or the private sector. And, and uh, so I think that, uh, to me, the CFPA bill is, a, in my view, actually an anti-consolidation bill, and in that way is a good thing. Thank you. Thank you all, members of the panel. And, and before we get the audience involved, let me give each of you a chance to either extend your remarks, comment on those of others, challenge others. Eric Ali. Well, let me make a, a comment on the, the, the state issue and uh, the difficulty that I think uh, financial institutions have with, with the idea of uh, state regulation of the federal charters, aside from the, the, you know, the sort of the supremacy clause issue, which is interesting. Uh, you're, you're writing that away, is that you essentially have national financial markets today. And it is cheaper and more efficient to deliver products on a national basis. And that has enabled, in, in some cases, I think, financial uh, services to be provided in places and at prices that it, they were not provided before. If you allow the states to set their own, to set individual standards, there are there are two uh, likely effects. One of them is that the cost of providing services nationally goes up as you have to comply with different requirements in different states, and, and that's sort of a, a dead cost issue. Uh, and then, as a practical response to that. You have, you're going to have a phenomenon that all states are not going to be equal. Uh, if the state of California or the state of New York or the state of Texas or the state of Florida, some of the big states, adopt an aggressive requirement, it is very likely they will continue to get financial services from national providers. And in fact, they may t tailor the national product to meet those state requirements just so that they have a common platform <coughs> across all the states. If Vermont does that, there aren't going to be any services in Vermont from the national providers. They're just not going to respond. And so you don't really have, if you think about it as, if you think about it as more people doing enforcement, yes, you have more people doing enforcement. You may have more rules. You can divide the enforcement and the rule issue to address that. But also in the rule context, you, you're going to have 
individual states in essence exercising authority over under other individual states which is not really terribly consistent with state rights and federalism no i think those those are certainly the two major arguments that have been made against state involvement my view is that i mean i don't think that that to me financial services is any more uniquely federal a a business than many other businesses in other words one could say well in fact you know california by pushing the car manufacturers on 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 air emissions you know got cleaner cars faster um you know when congress was was slower on willing to act for some for perhaps reasons of political influence or otherwise california acted i do agree that i think that there there are going to not every state is going to be able to sort of squarely step in and and establish its own rules and i think to some extent that will discipline the states i mean i think the states uh you know would have to say look if if we're if we're unreasonable uh and and overly ham-handed about how we approach it uh we we there will be costs to our citizens in either in higher costs or reduced services but i think that there are, are at least you know several uh states uh, maybe maybe 8 10 uh, or, or so that that could be you know significant players um and again if my view would be if the financial services industry had a had a record of uh you know being focused on on serving the consumer not not exploiting the consumer not not hiding things from the consumer you know being good citizens um then i would say you know the the the, the disadvantages that, that i think ali has properly pointed out you know it would be hard to justify them but i mean i'm sorry to say this is an industry that to me has had a a 20 year record that's that's very hard to defend i mean it's very hard to defend uh i think on credit cards i think on overdrafts uh i think on on mortgages uh i think on a lot of stuff you see you know similar types of 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 behavior which is uh in my view exploitive uh abusive deceptive And what's interesting is that they didn't actually stop just with subprime mortgages or residential mortgages. They did the same thing with commercial mortgages. They did the same thing with LBOs and and you know two two big concerns that we have right now are the commercial real estate market is you know is about where the residential market was in late 2007 and everybody's waiting to see you know when this shoe drops and and you can't refinance commercial mortgages what kind of disasters are we going to find? Uh and there are a lot of LBOs and and other corporate transactions out there that are going to have to be refinanced that can't be refinanced right now so that in a sense uh the the problem with lack of response on on residential lending was that i think it then encouraged the industry to do the same thing across the board uh so again i i see this the state action is really being kind of a second best if the industry won't restrain itself and the feds aren't doing a good job then i think the states have a role to play I jump in on that Eric? point as well and Ali, I'm sorry that there's uh two uh versus one on this one point that's life uh, I'm often times in the one so yeah. what the heck um so on the cost point what I would say first is that these days the cost of compliance are lower than they've been we had a vendor come in who has automated compliance for the different state laws for mortgages and could run 1000 mortgages through this automated system for compliance with each of the state laws plus the federal rules that's not to say that there are can be no cost of compliance mm-hmm. there definitely substantial ones but it's a lot lower than it was and easier to track so the costs are lower but the costs of non-compliance are very high and i think that's what we're seeing now i mean the costs of the massive foreclosures that we're facing a lot of what uh and a large reason for that as i described i think is the la- is the lack of consumer protection in mortgage lending I mean that is huge and i think you have to weigh the benefits of it against the costs and secondly in terms of states um individual states uh, the propriety of them acting if cfpa does its job it has the it would have the authorities under the um, proposals now to really do a good job and address problems in the market if it acts in a strong um reasonable manner the states are not going to have such an incentive to pass their own individual laws i mean it's it's very difficult um to in a state level to pass laws on financial services there are lobbies in congress uh that are working now the same is true at the state level and the incentive just isn't going to be there the efficacy of passing saying that there's a real problem we have to address is much uh less strong and so when cfpa is is active um is on the job that people know that 
there's going to be fewer state laws that have passed. But the converse is also true. We, you cannot promise that an agency is going to be strong into the future, that it's going to be responsible, that it's going to be looking out for consumers. You can set up the authorities, but you can't promise that that's going to be the case. And that's where the states come in as a counterbalance. And I think that's the role that Art pointed out that they played. 30 plus states passed laws protecting uh, people from mortgage lending. The laws weren't perfect. They didn't um, prevent all the problems. But there are a couple of recent academic studies, one from a guy who's now at HUD, uh, Rafael Bostic, um, who I think is in California um, uh, University when he did the study. And then UNC just came out with one as well, looking at mortgage lending. The states that had the stronger laws have had fewer foreclosures, um, that mortgage lenders were able to comply with those laws and modify the terms and make them less uh, abusive, really is the appropriate word which is these particular terms associated with more foreclosures, there are fewer of those. The foreclosures are lower um, as a result. And the states acted because it was clear that the federal government wasn't. The federal government um, passed HOPA in 1994, but nothing really happened uh, substantially until October 1st of this year when the Federal Reserve's HOPA rulemaking came into effect. And it was clear back in 2001, um, uh, Alan Greenspan said, you know, we're not going to do something about mortgage lending. The states had no choice but to act. If you had told the states that they couldn't act back in 2001, and as the laws that they passed, the problem would be even worse than it is. And so I think you really need that check, that counterbalance that the states provide. If a state um, goes too far, I mean, Georgia did go too far in its law, and the capital evapor threatened to evaporate in the state, and it is closer um, to the citizens, and on a dime, they actually went further than they needed to. There was a, an election and, um, and the bill was cut back in other ways as well that weren't uh, really responsive to that issue. But it did act uh, to address that issue. Um, and the states can act much more quickly than Congress can as proved by 30 versus zero. Um, so I think having a substantial state role, both in the rule writing and the enforcement um, over that federal floor is important. The floor is open. Well, we could debate this issue for a long time. <laughs> right. um, you know, most of the, I think most of the positions have been stated and people can argue about uh, which one is, is more valid. Uh, it's, con Congress is going to sort out how it thinks it's going to address, it's going to address this issue. Uh, I do think that if, if the idea that more broadly speaking than, than preemption that the states are going to solve the federal government's problems is uh, a very optimistic view and the idea that states uh, state legislatures are uh, going to necessarily behave rationally and not act because the federal government has acted i think is uh, inconsistent with my experience in legislation both at this federal level and at the state level. If you have questions, raise a hand and we'll bring you a microphone so we can hear you. We thought okay, Eric's the, the solution was partly up here, but the rest of it must be with you. <laughs> I'll happily to refer to anybody else who wants to charge in. Turn the mic off, though. Can you turn the mic? And off. If nobody else wants to charge in, uh, I, I guess I've charged in with a blindfold before, so let me try it again. Uh, it, it's always interesting and perhaps inevitable in this climate to talk about what caused our financial disaster. Was it subprime loans? Were they the cause? Were they the effect? Was it what? Some folks were doing it in an AIG subsidiary in London. Is it as various economic analysts argue in the inevitable consequence of free markets and human nature? Uh, uh, was it the failure to uh, give power to uh, require more capital in Fannie and Freddie? These are great issues and we can argue them endlessly, but I want to suggest that they're really not relevant to this particular question of whether this agency should be created and whether power should be consolidated in an agency. Uh, I do want to, and, and, and I suggest that the um, preemption argument, as interesting as that is and has been for many, many decades, it's a footnote. It doesn't go to the core of the issue. 
Uh, what I'd, I'd be interested in whether the panelists uh, agree I don't know what I'm talking about or whether there's some slight merit to this suggestion. First, there's a problem. The banking agencies, to my knowledge, have never been effective enforcers of consumer protection laws. And you can point to a lot of reasons for that, ranging from uh, lack of resources to lack of training to lack of interest. But whether the consumer protection laws are TILA or laws against racial discrimination or mortgage regulations, it's always been a stepchild of the banking agencies, at least the ones I'm familiar with. Maybe Ollie's experience of the Fed is different. But the second point, which is the, is the other side of this tug of war, is that there's a clear relationship between safety and soundness regulation and consumer protection regulation. There, each affects the other. And I, I think P Professor Wilmarth and others have given us reasons for that. So I, I want to suggest to you that there may be two ways of cutting through this knot, both of which involve consolidation. And just on their merits, whether they make sense to you or not, and let's put aside all these other very fascinating and unresolvable questions. Uh, so let's stipulate that the agencies, for whatever reason, simply haven't enforced these laws effectively. Uh, you may not agree with me, but my own view is that on those sporadic uh, occasions when they do, uh, it's generally uh, by heavy-handed consent decrees rather than giving legal guidance, and it's erratic and occasional. That argues strongly for some form of consolidation. I'd suggest to you that there are two types of consolidation, neither of which would require us to establish and organize and staff an entirely new bureaucracy. First, if legislation is passed consolidating the bank regulatory agencies, the, there should be greater resources available, greater ability to focus on consumer protection. Why then should not consolidated consumer protection regulation be placed within the ba a single banking agency if one is created. If it is not, why shouldn't that authority be put within the Federal Trade Commission, which already shares with the Federal Reserve Board at least some ability to enforce consumer protection laws? I think TILA may be an example, if I remember correctly, and which is an experienced and I think well-regarded consumer protection agency. Why do we need a new bureaucracy. I apologize for the long-winded way of getting to my punchline. I'll start a, a very good question. Um, what I, so the first one is a hypothetical. If, um, if there's one regulator, period, um, for banks, is that right? Then why shouldn't... And those proposals depending whether they'll go any farther than they have in So Senator Dodd did propose one single um, uh, federal regulator and um, and Chairman Frank didn't, and we'll, we'll see what happens in the in the Senate. Um, part of the problem with consumer protection um, with the safety and soundness regulators is arbitrage, as I talked about, as Art um, talked about, as you mentioned. Um, and that, uh, if there were truly a single um, one, that would help in that regard. Um, you would still have even the Senate proposal has. Um, credit union separate. Um, so there's not actual total uh, consolidation. Um, and uh, it still has uh, state banks and federal banks uh, with different responsibilities for the federal regulator. There's not, even under um, the most optimistic, there's still the opportunity for arbitrage. Some credit unions, as you probably know, have converted to banks. There's still going to be some um, to the uh, if the, uh, and this is hypothetical, um, but, but arbitrage is always, uh, again, about structure. Um, if the credit union lets the credit unions get away with something, um, then the bank, uh, then there's, because there's, because they're often, community banks and credit unions are fierce competitors fighting for the same customers in many cases. Um, so the arbitrage isn't entirely gone. You still have the issue of focus um, within the single strong um, bank regulator there's still going to be the issue of subordinate status 
um, of what is the uh, career path, what's, where's the focus, and I don't think the only reason that the um, safety and soundness regulators did not prioritize safety and soundness to be arbitrage, I think that's a significant one, but not the only one. So that's why I still think that having somebody focused on consumer protection um, would really be helpful. Your second question about the FTC, uh, if there are more than one, then why not just fold it into the FTC? That's definitely something that we considered, and it definitely there's a, a plausible case to be made. Ultimately, the administration concluded that the FTC actually um, has a split mission itself. As, as you know, there's competition as well as consumer protection. It's the closest uh, federal agency that would be has consumer protection as an agency other than the SEC on investment products. That's not part of the discussion with CFPA. But it has that split mission, and um, it uh, and it is just an enforcement agency. It doesn't do supervision. That's not been its culture um, or its desire. The um, there's, it's only like 60 or 70 people who work on consumer financial protection at the agency. Um, so the fact that it's it's an existing agency would be helpful in the startup. But it, you're talking about bringing a much larger entity in um, to deal with that. And we just don't think the advantages, because um, then again you have the split mission, are worth uh, the efficiencies that you gain. Yeah. I think there are a variety of ways to address the, the issue. I, I, I continue to think and, you know, there's the diffuse rule writing is, is kind of inefficient and there are obviously ways to consolidate that. But let me address your idea of, of putting it in whatever the ultimate banking agency is and leaving aside the credit union problem for a moment. It's the arbitrage between credit unions uh, charters and bank charters is probably a little more difficult than between state and national banks and, and thrifts and national banks as a logistical matter. Though the, the pressure, the competitive pressure would be there, that, that may not be a bad thing. Uh, part of the issue, I think, is congressional. And I think this goes also to the preemption issue. And in the area of monetary policy, for example, the Federal Reserve Chairman is required to go up to the Hill twice a year and report on what they're doing and why they're doing it. And that same kind of oversight has not been applied to what the banking agencies did on consumer protection. And if, 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 if I had a consolidated banking agency, uh, as Senator Dodd has suggested, some others have suggested over the years, and somebody was going to go in that direction, and I was worried about it putting too much emphasis on consumer, on so-called safety and soundness as being distinct from consumer protection. I said previously I don't think they are, but if I thought they didn't have the balance right, there are other ways to fix that. And, the, uh, and other ways include getting them up there and publicly saying what they're doing and why they're doing it. And to put them through a, a public process to uh, solicit public input through comment process on what the problems are and to report on that regularly and create transparency in the regulatory process. You might want to do the same thing for safety and soundness, as a matter of fact, because I think you've had, uh, I think the failures here were as much in the safety and soundness area as they were in the consumer protection area. But there are ways to create greater um, transparency and visibility into the regulatory and supervisory process that could work either in the current structure or in any altered structure. And I, I, I think perhaps work more efficiently than creating a, a separate agency, which I think has, creates more coordination problems. They may not be insolvable, but you have, to, you have to figure out how to solve those coordination problems. And I don't think the current proposals do that. Uh, on, on the first point, I you know, I, I will confess that I'm an anti-consolidationist by, by deep conviction. Uh, I think the FSA is an interesting example, I mean, because they were a highly consolidated regulator. But they seem to have swung, I think like many, in my view, single regulators would swing, uh, between the pole of extreme li liberality. Uh, the, uh, you know, we're the no-touch regulator, we're the light-touch regulator, we're the London city, you know, Financial Center promoted regulator. You know, whatever whatever you want to do is fine. To suddenly, you know, n now the big hammer comes down and, and you have no appeal. You know, we're the only game in town, so now we're going to really crunch you. So, 
my view is that I, I, I'm, a, I'm afraid that, that a single regulator, you know, would tend to swing between those poles, uh, and, and, and uh, that the industry might very well regret that they ever asked for one. Um, but I also pick up with Eric's point that I think that, uh, unfortunately, consumer protection, I think, has always been a stepchild of the, of the financial agencies, and I think will always be. Uh, one, because the industry doesn't like it very much, and secondly, I think, as you've indicated, because it's not the career path to, to pr prominence within the agency. Uh, and third, because unfortunately, we, we seem to, to focus, uh, which is a problem across our, our economy, that uh, safety and soundness means short-term profitability, or you know, success means uh, you know, this quarter's profits. I mean, I think part of what drove, apparently, you know, my question about why did risk management fail, it seemed as though that at these major banks, they were thinking about nothing but next quarter's profits, and they couldn't even look to the next, you know, a year or two, three years down the road when obviously everybody must have known the housing market was at some point going to cool off. Uh, so I worry that that uh, safety and sound is under pressure from the industry becomes short-term profitability and therefore anti-consumer protection. Uh, so I, 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 you know, I wish I, I wish it would work otherwise, but I'm just not confident after you know watching this for 30 years that the financial agencies will ever embrace whether it's one or many will ever embrace consumer protection as a major thing. Um, the FTC question is an interesting one, and it's a really close call for me. And it's a close call because, I mean, Eric makes a good point about the split mission, but uh, again, this is my, uh, maybe my Brandeisian uh, viewpoint, but I actually think competition and consumer protection belong together in some ways. And part of the problem I think we see in this industry is, you know, four banks have 60% of the mortgage market now, and four or five banks have 70 or 80% of the credit card market now. And, and you're beginning to see real pricing effects from those kinds of consolidation. And antitrust has just disappeared. I mean, antitrust doesn't matter anymore in the financial services industry. And so, you know, I, 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 I can't say I would be wholly unhappy with a consumer protection regulator that actually had a, a competition. No, no, you'd have to change the law. You'd have to change the law and allow the FTC to actually go after uh, financial institutions on, on competition grounds. It's a close question for me, but I, I think that what I do want is this function to go to an agency that really cares about it and prioritizes it and believes in it. Um, so, you know, I, I wouldn't have been on actually that uh, opposed to the idea of the FTC, uh, but I think it's either in, in a, an FTC that can go after banks or in, in the CFPA. It, it seemed that um, a lot of your justifications or, or concerns about why the agency was necessary was the failure of the existing federal agencies to exercise the authority that they had, and you just characterized them as a stepchild, that the OCC didn't, didn't do it, there was a sleep at the switch, those kinds of things. If that's the case, why then, in the creation of the new agency, is it necessary to dramatically expand the powers? Why, is it, why isn't it sufficient and appropriate to just shift over to the agency, the existing powers with an agency that doesn't have a dual mission and is focused on consumer protection, let them enforce the substantial number of laws that are on the books already? That's a, that's a good question. I think, um, in our view, we're not expanding the powers that are there because the banking agencies have, have authority over the banks that they regulate. And under the broad safety and soundness requirement on the FDI Act, they can do everything that we're trying to uh, provide C CFPA with the authority to do. So the first thing that the, um, the, I'm sorry, can you not hear me? Um, the first thing is that the CFPA would enforce the consumer protection laws. And the idea is that um, in some cases, the laws aren't going to directly speak to the problems that exist. The banking agencies right now have the flexibility legally to jump in and deal with emerging problems as they exist if Congress hasn't spoken on it under the safety and soundness requirements. I mentioned a couple that the um, banking agencies used, the, um, the subprime guidance for clear and balanced disclosure and um, uh, the 2005 OCC rules on abusive and unfair and deceptive mortgages. Um, those were emerging problems that the banking agencies were, were able to um, put forward rules for and uh, the CFPA wouldn't have any greater ability to do it than the banking agencies do now. If, um, if the 
enumerated statute, the consumer protection statutes aren't enough to deal with something, CFPA can move more quickly with additional authorities. Congress can always step in and say, that's not right, you went too far. Um, but you don't have to wait uh, so long for something to be done about it. So the authorities are no greater than what the banking agencies have with banks. We're trying to provide also the ability to do oversight for the non-banks as well. I, I, I think that's an understatement. I, I think you know, the banks have safety and soundness authority and, they have, and the Federal Reserve has uh, UDAP rule writing authority. Uh, the other banking agencies have taken the position that they have uh, unfair and deceptive act and practice enforcement authority and nobody's fighting about that. Um, but the agency is articulated in this statute has uh, broader mandates or directions to write an awful lot of rules on, spe on specific issues. And while you can argue that under the general rule writing authorities and, and, and supervisory authorities, uh, the other people might get to the same place, and that might be true, I think as a practical matter, you're very strongly encouraging the development of a larger rule set than you would otherwise see by enacting an aid, the agency statute in this form. Um, well, I think that leads directly into the, into the question I'd like to pose. Um, federal consumer protection agency, uh, consumer protection, the exercise of federal consumer protection has been primarily aimed at disclosure as opposed to what I'll call substantive practice restrictions. I mean, you know, there was the credit practices rule that you know, this 10-year slog to come forth with this relatively modest rule back in the 70s, and I think everybody was exhausted, and it, it really showed the, the fundamental philosophical approach to, uh, that was elected on the federal level that was primarily you tell people in certain ways what it is that you're entering into, and then people decide on that basis. And the substantive regulation was much more common on the, on the state level. Uh, it seems to me, and following up directly from Ollie's last point, that what may be happening now is I think you're starting to see already existing agencies move away from that and much more towards the substantive model. Now, you know, undoubtedly part of this is politically driven as the agencies are trying to hold on to the consumer protection authorities that they have under the current structure. But the Fed has done more in terms of substantive restrictions on practices, whether you like that or not. I think it's clear that they have done more in that regard in the last, say, 12 or 24 months than they've had since they had UDAP kinds of authorities, which goes back at least 15 years. Uh, another remarkable development in this, in this uh, line, it seems to me that I'm, I'm amazed, hasn't been more widely reported. The comptroller gave a speech three weeks ago in Tokyo where he said that and he was speaking to his counterparts from industrialized countries all over the world. He said that he's determined that given the experience of the last couple of years, it's now necessary for the regulatory agencies to develop not best practices, not guidances, but specific underwriting standards. And this, is a, you know, this was a Bush appointee, and he, in his remarks he made clear that this was an approach that he was philosophically and by predisposition and by education inclined against and yet he felt that this was necessary. Now some of it may be politically driven. Sorry, can you say again what he, what he talked about? He's proposing developing specific mortgage underwriting standards. He gave a speech on the 16th of November in Tokyo. It's on the OCC website. I'm, I'm amazed that there hasn't been more publicity about it because I think it's really reflective of a shift that I think the market has driven in regulatory activity. Well, having said that, if this change is really occurring and you know, putting aside the motivations and whether it'll continue, I haven't heard any discussion about what the relative pros and cons of consolidation of this authority into one agency are with respect to what seems to be a trend in the, in the regulatory world, if you will, towards more substantive regulation. Because I, I could easily see, just thinking off the top of my head, that the industry, if they don't like 
if they don't like various disclosure requirements, they're going to go bananas talking about substantive restri uh, practice restrictions. Uh, and yet, if that's what the political environment is demanding, then I, I could see, you know, that, that leaving, I could see easily saying that leaving the current structure would increase the likelihood of uh, agency arbitrage. You're at substantive standards. I'm and sorry? I, you're at substantive standards. All of the, you know, the banking agencies that had the powers, uh, including the NCUA and the OTS, were proposing very substantive standards, for example, in the credit card area before the, the recent credit card legislation. I think that bridge has been crossed. Uh, I think what Mr. Dugan is talking about is yet a, a further step in, you may think, into underwriting standards, but if you go back and you look at the alternate mortgage guidance, it says you've got to underwrite to the, you know, the full rate. That it's going to march to. That's a substantive underwriting standard. Those but he also said that this has that uh, a best practice or a guideline was no longer sufficient. Well, it had to have force of law. The, I mean, it's in his. It's in the, his I, the idea. The, the idea that that he doesn't have the force of law over a national bank's underwriting standards is is uh, understating his own powers significantly in the terms of guidance. If you're going to, you, you have a problem if the national bank has one set of standards and, and the private mortgage brokers have a completely different set of standards. And I think you've got to deal with that problem. But I think uh, whether you like it or not, the, the era of relying solely on disclosure as the consumer arm is gone. It's over. Like, it's absolutely. over. It's interesting. Uh, I, I'm, I'm old enough to remember, vaguely, uh, the, the pre-19, I believe, either 80 or 82 version of 12 U.S.C. 371, which had very specific loan-to-value ratios for all different types of land. And for raw land, I think it was 60. Uh, I think for, uh, uh, you know, multifamily, it was 80. I think maybe, or maybe 70, and that was 80, I think, for one to four family structures. And What's interesting is all that was repealed in 1982, I think it was, uh, and, and, we, and everything was handed over to the business judgment of the banks by, by OCC rule. And uh, William Seidman in, in his book called Full Faith and Credit said that was the law that brought us the real estate crisis of the 80s when they took all the LTV ratios off of, of lending. Um, now interestingly, in 1991, uh, Congress told the agencies by interagency standard to reimpose all those LTV type guidelines. Uh, I, I need to go back and look because I think they did in 1992 and I can't quite figure out why all those LTV guidelines seem to have been totally ignored you know, during the last seven or eight years. But I mean, I, I think that, yes, I think that the, the idea that um, disclosure was enough and, and business judgment was enough, I wish it were so. It's a wonderful theory, but it doesn't seem to have worked very well over the last 20, 25 years. One further point out with the Federal Reserve on the yield spread premium rule, which is out for comment now, which deals with mortgage brokers and lenders um, who charge the borrower more. Um, the more that they charge the borrower, the more they get paid. But borrowers don't tend to know that. And so mortgage <laughs> brokers received higher compensation if they put a borrower in a loan with a prepayment penalty that the borrower doesn't understand, or a higher interest rate, or a structure where the uh, rates rise later. So the same, very same borrower would have got, um, was going to receive 1%, the broker would receive 1% if they put them in a fixed rate 30-year loan that the person qualified for. If you put that same borrower in a subprime loan, then the um, broker or the lender would receive 3%. So you can see where the financial incentives lay, and you can, that partly explains the explosion of subprime and Alte lending because uh, the, the amount that the originator received was higher for that very same borrower. And that's a, a really, when someone goes to a mortgage broker, it's a very complicated, taking out loans is a very complicated endeavor. And there's a certain amount of trust face to face that you put with the person who you think is there to give you the best job possible. And people just didn't know that uh, it wasn't actually an agency relationship. This person was looking out for their own interests, which were totally adverse to yours. Higher your interest rate, the more they were paid. Uh, 
The Federal Reserve's rule under HOPA in, in 1994, HOPA was passed, it provided rulemaking authority to the Federal Reserve to deal with abusive, unfair, deceptive practices in mortgage lending. And the initial rule out for comment that the Federal Reserve did was to disclose that relationship, to tell the borrower, you know what, I'm going to give you advice, but my interests aren't the same as yours. Uh, I get paid. And I'm not, I think it even described how they got paid with the higher interest rate. And then the Federal Reserve, partly maybe political, not in this case, but um, in terms of substantive regulations being there, partly it's experience, partly it's testing. The Federal Reserve did focus groups and found that people – they, they could not understand it. The disclosures just didn't work, so they took that out of the final HOPA rule to their credit, went back, tested further, and then they came up with the rule that's out for comment now, which I think is a very strong rule, just said simply, you can't charge a borrower more based on the terms of the mortgage. How do you go ahead? I'm just going to say I think we've held our speakers beyond what they agreed, so right. I hate to to call it to a close, but I don't want to impose on their time anymore. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Thank you to our speakers.